Today's movie is one of the best cinematic adaptations of the work of horror author H.P. Lovecraft. Which is funny since it's not actually an adaptation of anything Lovecraft actually wrote. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling John Carpenter's classic cosmic horror flick, In the Mouth of Madness. Released in 1995, this one is a fantastic film inspired by the works of horror fiction legend H.P. Lovecraft. While not based on any one particular piece of the author's work, this one instead just nails the vibe of those classic tales of terror about elder gods lurking in the darkness waiting to devour humanity. This one was the third and final film in Carpenter's Apocalypse Trilogy, three narratively unconnected films about the end of the world. It sits alongside The Thing and Prince of Darkness, and like so many of Carpenter's projects, it was at least a little bit ahead of its time. Like both of the aforementioned titles, this one took a bit of time to find an audience who got it. But now that it has, it regularly turns up on best of lists. And rightly so. It's really a great riff on Lovecraft's work made accessible for a more modern audience. But enough about that. Can In the Mouth of Madness bring forth enough Elder Gods to earn a coveted 5 barf bag rating? Let's get to the gore and find out. Today's movie deals with an author writing books designed to bring the old ones back to end the world and enslave humanity. It sounds pretty scary, but if you like your books entertaining, colorful, and way less likely to summon elder gods from beyond the stars who will drive you mad, you'll definitely want to check out today's sponsor, Riserverse Comics. A creative endeavor from Haley Rhine, Ikibo Gawatsky, Evan Momeyer, and artist Emi Me, the Riserverse is a labor of love for all involved. And like all good comics, the Riserverse has a super cool origin story. Their journey began with Haley crafting a team of superpower vigilantes purely for her own enjoyment. What started as tales whispered in her mind eventually blossomed into the expansive universe known as the Riserverse. Hundreds of pages of gripping short stories later, she teamed up with friends and family and embarked on a new chapter, channeling those narratives into the dynamic world of comics. The Riserverse gang isn't just tied to one comic genre though. Their love for the medium is boundless and their tales cross genres moving seamlessly between horror, comedy, romance, and drama with ease. But here's the twist. Every story, every stroke of artistry, every word is crafted by human hands, eschewing artificial intelligence for the authenticity of human creativity. You can tell these guys are talented and dedicated in their graphic novel, The Fool's Gambit, which introduces a world known as Aspis, wherein factions of people, both mundane and superpowered, struggle amongst one another, as well as creatures both supernatural and technological. Part 1 introduces you to the vampire Ovidiu, werewolves, a wretched embodiment of hunger and greed named Deerstalker, and a few of the prominent factions, specifically the militaristic Ember Eyes group, the zealous followers of Father Redemption, and the benevolent Dawnbreakers. The best part? This is just the opening salvo in a bigger tale that promises more action and more splatter in the upcoming The Fool's Gambit Part 2. But before that happens, you can head on over to the Riserverse website and order your copy of the second printing of the first installment of The Fool's Gambit, which is coming soon. Oh, and if you're going to be at Three Rivers Comic Con in Pittsburgh this June, you'll be able to pick up the limited edition Three Rivers Comic Con exclusive Riserverse Comics Presents, Inquietist and Vespiar. There's only 100 of those available, so be sure to grab one if you're there. As a guy who's loved comics for his entire life, I mean, I literally learn to read on issues of The Amazing Spider-Man, I can't tell you how much joy it brings me to see indie creators breaking down the walls in the comic space. These graphic novels are slick, professional looking, have fantastic artwork, and I can't wait to see where this series goes next. If you'd like to learn more about the Riserverse Comics team, you'll find lots more info at their website, Riserverse.com. I've got links in the pinned comment and description below. If you'd like to help the Riserverse team keep production rolling, you can also check out their Kickstarter, which will get you all sorts of goodies for your support. I'll include the link to that below as well. Thanks again to Riserverse Comics, when the extraordinary becomes reality one panel at a time, for sponsoring today's video. And now, let's get bloody. We fade in on some credits. Sam Neill? About time we got him on this show. Honestly, I kind of thought it would be for his work in The Omen 3, but whatever. Hey, here's Julie Carmen, who was in the wildly underappreciated Fright Night Part 2. And Jürgen Prock now, who's one of those great character actors you recognize instantly. He has quite the resume. This film, The Keep, Das Boot, and here's a title card. Pretty middle of the road, honestly. David Warner too? Jesus, Carpenter really could assemble a cast. Anyway, we last saw him in Body Bags. Hey, I thought this was a movie, not an industrial video about publishing industry equipment. And John Glover? 
I'm contractually obligated to tell you Glover might have played the greatest devil ever in Brimstone. I'm also obligated to tell you it's tragic that Fox killed Brimstone before it ever got a chance to find an audience. Here's Carpenter regular Peter Jason. We last saw him in Prince of Darkness. My god, it's Charlton Heston! Look out, you damn dirty apes! Ooh, FX by the KNB crew. It should be good. Ah, oh, yeah, it's nice they took up all this beachfront real estate with a sanitarium. Seems important that the criminally insane should get a good view. All right, Mr. Carpenter, we'll start the movie now. And directed by John Carpenter. I don't even know what's left to say about Carpenter at this point. Man is an icon. Oh, sweet, John Glover is doing his best Bill Nye cosplay. And they're dragging in Sam Neill. He's wearing a straight jacket, which implies the existence of a gay jacket. Oh, so working as an orderly here appears to be a real drag. Huh, guess Nurse Ratched got the day off. I'm not insane. You hear me? I'm not insane! Said every insane guy ever. He did it. See? Like condos for crazy dudes right there. Let's <laughs> just calm things down with some Freedom Rock. Sure hope this thing goes to 11. You kids even remember the old Freedom Rock commercials? Christ, I'm old. Sam Neill is like, I swear, I was on an island where they brought dinosaurs back to life. You gotta believe me. But it's about to get even worse. Oh, Not the carpenters too. <laughs> right there with you on that, Sam. And jump scare. You haven't read it yet. But it's just a weird fake out. Fun fact, the single bedroom efficiency is only running him two grand a month. Hey, it's David Warner. I'd like to go over our lines if you don't mind. This is like an Omen series reunion. Warner was in the first film, Neil the third. Anyway, Sam's been busy doing some redecorating. Oh yeah, I like when you've done with the place. Very crazy evangelical cat lady vibe you got going on in here. This is basically just how Sam Neil came back after his trip to the event horizon. Meanwhile, Warner's just here to ask the probing questions. I want to know how you got here. Um, it was in an ambulance. Didn't you see the opening scenes? But settle in, because this is all a framing device and Sam's about to kick this movie into gear by explaining what he was working on when he went crazy. All of this started with the disappearance. The Sutter Kane disappearance. Sutter Kane? Presumably no relation to Big Daddy Kane. Hey, that's you and Jefferson! I'm sorry, Mr. Jason, but we're denying your application to the Lambda 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 fraternity. You don't meet our melanin requirements. This must be a really rigorous frat interview. Dude's sweating like a pig. Look at you, Ed. He's like, can we wrap this up? I'm gonna attend to that whole thing over at Adams University. Man, Sam Neill is unflappable. You could say he's dead calm. Do you kids even remember that Sam Neill was in dead calm? Christ, I'm still old. Man, look at what the Alpha Betas did to those nerds. Trash their whole frat house. Wow, a product placement for the movie in the movie. It's like Inception up in here. Anyway, Sam and you and are having lunch, which is about to be interrupted by this dude working on his Paul Bunyan cosplay. Oh, and we got some important exposition here too. What's the claim? Sutter Kane's missing. Well, yeah, I guess we could put another doorway here. Excuse me, do you happen to have any gray poupon? I'm no ophthalmologist, but that boy's eyes ain't right. And then the cops waste them. Sure hope they had their body cams off. Later that night, Sam comes down with a drink. Damn it, we're out of J&B again! Man, look at all those Karens rioting to get a copy of the new Fifty Shades of Grey book. The stores could not meet the demand for advance orders of Sutter Kane's latest novel, In the Mouth of Madness. Title mention, drink. Oh man, I'm not nearly sober enough for this shit. So long, liver. Jesus, it's like a Bernie Wrightson art show. Oh hey, it's Charlton Heston. Look, I know Soil and Green is people. I was in the movie. All right, get out of my office. Here's Julie Carmen, looking all business professional. Since she joined the firm, she's been handling Sutter Kane exclusively. I mean, the guy that writes that horror crap. Whoa, whoa, settle down, Sam. Let's not say things we can't take back. Where's Hurt Man? And Julie's not having any of his guff either. You can forget about Stephen King. Kane outsells them all. Anyway, we know Kane's missing, but Heston is going to give us more details. Kane disappeared two months ago without a trace. The police have turned up nothing. Boy, the marketing department was really all in here. And here's one more bit of exposition. 
crazy guy with the axe? Yeah. That was Sutter Kane's agent. That lunatic with the axe? That was Kane's agent? Oh, yeah, Julie Carmen's had enough of Sam Neill's bullshit. Naturally, Sam's not buying this whole disappearing author thing. He smells a publicity stunt. I think it's great. It's great promotion for our Kane. Great publicity. But hey, he's here, so Sam's still gonna shoot a shot. Baby, if you were words on a page, I'd call you fine print. But he gets shot down. I don't think so. I don't want to alarm anyone, but Sutter Kane might be a nut job. He became convinced his writing was real, not fiction. Then the work stopped coming. Yeah, got my bottle of J&B, so that's tonight sorted. Hey, nothing to see here. We're just arresting Rodney King. Anyway, Neil is convinced this is a scam, although I'm not really sure I agree with him. Now relax, Robbie. Look, it's, it's a scam. Of course it's a scam. Um, the agent was clearly very committed to the scam if he got shot by the police for it. Just saying. God, those Harry Potter fans are ravenous for new books. Ah, yes, a young Mike Bracken wonders the horror section at Barnes & Noble. Oh, trust me, you don't want that Dean Koontz. Try this Jack Ketchum. It's way better. Later that night, Sam gets a call. I live in New York City. I don't even own a car. Why would I need an extended warranty? Um, there seems to be a tremendous buildup of gunk on this poster. And we're back to the cop beating the graffiti artist. With a twist this time. Except it's all just football practice. Or is it? And the locals are about to go all Lizzie Borden on the agent. Someone had a real axe to grind, apparently. Except it's just double football practice. We're running two a days. But we're not done. There's still one more jump scare. And triple football practice. I think that's a show first, and Sam Neill is now ready for the Super Bowl. After all that stress, he decides to calm down with an art project. This horror cover collage is gonna be awesome! Fun fact, all of the Sutter Kane novels have titles that are vaguely reminiscent of titles of popular H.P. Lovecraft works. The Hobbs End Horror, The Feeding, The Whisper in the Dark, Something in the Cellar, The Breathing Tunnel, and The Haunter Out of Time. The Lovecraftian inspirations were the Dunwich Horror, the Whisperer in Darkness, the Rats in the Walls, the Thing on the Doorstep, the Shadow Out of Time, and the Haunter of the Dark. The title of the film itself is a sort of play on Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, which was almost made into a big budget film by Guillermo del Toro a decade or so ago. Anyway, Neil cuts up all the covers, which are actually a map that leads to the fictional New England town of Hobbs End which is clearly located in New Hampshire. And with that, it's time for a road trip! God, they're using a map. You know this was the 90s. And it looks like Sam Neill is feeling horny. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, not like that, you pervs. I mean, he's gonna wake up Julie Carmen with this bike horn. This scenery is pretty amazing. Man, is this line eerily prophetic or what? Sane and insane could easily switch places if the insane were to become the majority. Anyway, they're lost, but it looks like they found Hobbs End, because here's a creepy kid biking in the middle of a dark road. Oh yeah, this dude looks great. And she nails him with the car. Her insurance premiums are gonna skyrocket. Oh, he's just got progeria. I can't get out. Come on. You won't let me out. So far, I'm a really big fan of this movie. So long, suckers. So wait, she ran down someone and he lets her keep driving? Great, she's now so tired she's hallucinating that they're flying. And it looks like she might have just driven into the bridges of Madison County. Oh look, they found Hobbs End! So it's been noted that Carpenter was a big fan of Quatermass in the Pit. Hobbs End is a reference to the subway station where the alien ship is excavated in that film. Uh-oh, looks like someone's on the wrong side of the tracks again. All right, let's get antiquing. Wait, Carpenter didn't remake Village of the Damned until after this movie. Anyway, they're off to get a room at the Pikmin Hotel. This is another nod to Lovecraft. The author published the story titled Pikmin's Model in the October 1927 issue of Weird Tales. And it turns out this is from one of Kane's novels, too. The hotel from... Hey, the inn is run by perennial grandma, Frances Bay. We lost her back in 2011, but she had an impressive body of work. Sweet, they have a Bob Ross original. Swanky. So, um, do you rent rooms by the hour? I'm not gonna need more than 15 minutes if you catch my drift. Back upstairs, Julie has a theory. What if Kane's work 
is in fiction. Lance Henriksen, care to weigh in on this? That's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but hey, at least they got a room with a sweet view. With that settled, they head out for some sightseeing. It's a place of pain and suffering beyond human understanding. <laughs> The local tourism board might want to hire a new copywriter. Interestingly, this dialogue, like many of the passages in the film from Kane's books, actually comes from Lovecraft's own stories. This one came from Haunter in the Dark, I think. Aw, oh, look at the time! We're running late, so I guess we'll have to miss mass. Damn it! Hey, here comes the Haddonfield mob! Hurry, we're late for communion! Oh shit, it's Vigo the Carpathian! This was Wilhelm von Homburg's last feature film role. Man, these doors are slamming like this is an onyx track. Hey, it's Sutter Kane! Like Sam Neill, Jurgen Prochnow wasn't the only guy considered for a part in this film. Apparently, Carpenter was really interested in casting Rutger Hauer as the mysterious author, but I don't think there was really a wrong choice when it came to Hauer or Prochnow. They're both fantastic talents. Oh god, we've got puppies! Hell yeah. No, I mean actual puppies. Because someone let these Dobermans out. Fun fact, I've been bitten by Dobermans multiple times. No other breed of dog has bitten me more. Honestly, there's more dog carnage in this scene than in the entirety of Monster Dog. Anyway, despite all of these revelations, Sam Neill is still not convinced this isn't a con. So you can't bullshit a bullshit, can you? Because I'll tell you how, this whole thing has been staged, that's how. And again, how do you explain the agent getting gunned down by the cops as part of the con, Sam? But surprise, he's not totally wrong. You're half right. This was a hoax. We did send Kane away on a publicity stunt, only he never showed up. And now she's going to make her move. Is this the library? Because I've been checking you out. Sam's like, yeah, you're pretty hot, but I have a strict no crazy chicks rule. Oh, look, the Bob Ross painting is different. I'm just going to add some happy little corpses here. And we learn what happened to Mrs. Pickman's husband. Definitely gives new meaning to the phrase, the old ball and chain. God, there's nothing to do in this town. Man, I better get right with God. I might not make it till the end of this movie. Oh no, upside down cross, run! Just gonna check in here and see if I can find some communion wine to take the edge off. Aw oh, crap, it's just the priest's office. Sorry Padre. Punch the keys for God's sake. Just insert your own, you're the man now dog joke here. Bear with me, I'm just finishing up this week's newsletter. Gotta promote the bake sale. And I'm sure this is fine, no cause for alarm at all. Hmm, guess she's found a new bow since Sam Neill rejected her. Or maybe he's just her hairdresser. You've got very dry hair and split ends, Julie. Let me fix that. Ah, oh, great. He's basically Quato from Total Recall. Um, remember how I said I didn't need an extended warranty for my car? Well, will that cover my crazy girlfriend stealing it? If so, I'd like to reconsider. And jump scare. This shot was filmed with the creeper cam they installed in the hotel room to catch unwary guests having sex. We're gonna need fresh towels in room 237. God, you can't even get an Uber in this town. What a shithole. Bob Ross painting changes again. Just gonna add some happy little elder chores. I think I found the root of the problem in this place. But I will say this, Granny's Bible Black cosplay is looking sweet. Great, this place doesn't have bed bugs, but it's infested with tentacle demons. Oh, it's one of the Zagons from this island Earth. Where's Exeter? Sam Neill's off to buy a 50 gallon drum of Roundup. But before he can do that, it looks like the locals are getting ready to light the wicker man. Man, I need like 10 drinks to deal with this town. Except he's still trying to convince himself this is all a hoax. Special effects. Hidden speakers, you people are professionals, I'll give you that. Oh shit, it's like he wandered into Yarnum and Bloodborne. And then Julie gives him a heaping helping of pimp fist. But Sam's not a turn the other cheek kind of guy and delivers a pimp fist to his own. By God, it's a real slobber knocker down here. Pretty solid JR this week. Strange way to pick up chicks, but I'm not here to judge. He's gonna drive them out of here, but she's got the keys. And she's hungry. Fun fact, the keys were made out of pasta. They eventually do get the car rolling, and I don't think making out while driving is really all that safe. Oh hey, it's the weird creepy guy on the bike again. Oh wow, Sam might want to reconsider hooking up with this chick. She's a contortionist. They actually did hire a contortionist for this scene. And say what you will, but Julie Carmen is the kind of chick who will bend over backwards for you. And now it's a Tom Cochran song. Because life is a highway. And it's also a time loop, apparently. 
Yep, just like Groundhog Day. This time, he's going to take the Mr. Mercedes approach. The only way out is through indeed. But he wipes out like a Beach Boy song and wakes up in confession. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I was the Antichrist in Omen 3. Anyway, this is basically Kane's Bond villain moment. His books are paving the way for the return of the old ones. When people begin to lose their ability to know the difference between fantasy and reality, the old ones can begin their journey back. Hey, hey, this confessional is occupied. Bad priest. Turns out the book is done and he wants Sam to take it back to his publisher. Hey, I'm not your courier, man. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh shit, he's back on the event horizon. And say what you will, but these Sutter Kane books are real page turners. Look out, here come the old ones. And Sam's back in his world. I'm not gonna lie, this scene feels pretty corny. Anyway, he winds up at a hotel. And this place is pretty sweet because they got Robot Monster on pay-per-view. Hey, the AC doesn't work in my room. I'm expecting a discount. Oh god, and he's got a package. Great, another copy of this crappy manuscript. I've heard of hot new books, but this seems on the nose. Oh god, this is what happens to me every time I'm on a plane. Someone has to tell me their life story. And this is my exact reaction to every time I've ever had to take a Greyhound bus. But eventually, he makes his way back to Charlton Heston. <laughs> yeah, I had a crazy dream like that once. I dreamt I was on a planet run by apes. But don't worry, Sam's gonna save us from the old ones. And that's why I had to destroy the last manuscript, you know. Except... You delivered that manuscript to me months ago. To me personally, in this room. See, you can never really beat the old ones. But wait, it gets worse. I know this book will drive people crazy. Well, let's hope so. The movie comes out next month. The line for the new Harry Potter book is totally out of control. And Sam Neill is like, let me ask you about how this book ends. And back to the framing story. <laughs> Look at David Warner. He's like, you are completely out of your gourd. And it turns out that Sam Neill was basically right. The world has gone mad after reading In the Mouth of Madness. <laughs> Guess they gave the cleaning staff the year off. So what would you do at the end of the world? Go to the movies. Um, so did he make his own popcorn and start the projector? I mean, there's no one working at the end of the world, right? Yeah, that's reality. <laughs> Not reality. Reality. This is my reaction to most gory horror movies, too. And cue credits. So, what have we learned from In the Mouth of Madness? Well, for starters, the John Carpenter probably made the best HP Lovecraft movie adaptation, even though this film wasn't actually based on Lovecraft's work. As the third entry in Carpenter's Apocalypse trilogy, this one holds its own. It's a clever cosmic horror piece that hits all the notes you expect these kinds of stories to nail, but does so in a way that's familiar without feeling totally derivative. It's not as good as The Thing, or as deep as Prince of Darkness, but it definitely delivers the goods if you love the Elder Gods mythos stuff Lovecraft made so popular. But enough about that. Can In the Mouth of Madness summon enough old ones to earn a coveted five barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, this one really isn't anything special. Which is a bummer, since it involves the KNB FX team. We're treated to some axe murder, some mutated people, lots of tentacles, some elder gods, and that's about it. The gore in this one isn't really the focus, so there's not a ton of it. In the Mouth of Madness is more interested in the vibe than the splatter, and that's okay because it really nails the vibe. But I can't in good conscience give this one anything more than a two barf bag rating, and that's generous because there's really not a lot of splatter here even though the movie is excellent. This one isn't a sick flick, but it's a bona fide cult classic and another example of why I think Carpenter might have the best overall body of work of all the modern masters of horror. I just rarely missed. Looking for another Carpenter classic about the end of the world as we know it? Then be sure to check out my review of Prince of Darkness. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.